Good evening and welcome. Welcome to our first talk this month. Um, this is the Stained Glass Museum's online talk series and we're really, really delighted that Mark Angus has agreed to speak to us this evening. For those of you that don't know, I'll say a little bit about who I am and the, the Stained Glass Museum at the beginning. So my name is Jasmine Allen and I am the director and curator of the Stained Glass Museum which holds a nationally significant collection of stained glass dating from the medieval period to the present day. And by purchasing a ticket to this lecture, you're making a direct contribution to the museum, which is currently closed, um, but we hope will reopen soon. So thank you. For those of you joining us uh, from afar, um, the museum is located inside Ely Cathedral in Cambridgeshire in the UK. One of the advantages to moving our events online is of course being able to reach a wider audience and also to host speakers from further afield with more ease. So now it's my pleasure to welcome and introduce this evening's speaker, Mark Angus. Good evening, Mark. Um, so Mark Angus is a practicing artist based in Bavaria and he splits his time between Fraunau in Germany and Graz in Austria where he joins us this evening. Since graduating from Swansea School of Art where he studied architectural stained glass in 1978, Mark Angus has gained a reputation in Britain and Europe for his expressive stained glass art. His list of commissions is extensive. Um, I encourage you all to take a look at his web website, which is excellent and kept up to date. He's created windows for churches and cathedrals, as well as for other public and private spaces. Here in the UK, where, where I am, you may know his complete scheme of windows for Oundle School and his windows in the cathedrals of Durham and Guildford, just for starters. Mark is a skilled glass painter and acid etcher and has also recently been exploring printing from etched glass using a process known as vitrography. Alongside his own creations, he has taught in the USA, in Britain and Germany. And this evening, we're delighted that Mark is going to speak to us about his work over the last 40 years, covering architectural commissions, mainly for churches, but also his autonomous exhibition panels. So Mark, uh, welcome. Thank you for joining us this evening. And I just invite you to share your screen now so we can see your presentation. Uh -huh. Fantastic, we can see that. So I will shut up and disappear. Okay, well, thank you, Jasmine. So um, first of all, of course, I have to say hello. Hello to everybody. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of my friends there. Hello, friends. Hello, glass enthusiasts. Hello, fellow glass painters. I'm sure there's some architects or priests there. So hello to you both categories. And I also hope there's a lot of students um, who are attending tonight. You're very welcome. And, and hello to you all. And I'm going to tell you some stories about my life in stained glass. My expressive works in in glass and painting are rooted in the sense of a sacred space and the narrative relation to the world inherent in glass painting. I explore the borderline areas of human existence between abstraction and figurative expression, hence the title of the talk, a dialogue between poetry and abstraction. This concerns human experiences of uncertainty and, and ambiguity which are, which are revealed between the earthbound and the transcendental elements in my religious stained glass windows, and which translate in the secular work into an approach to the, to the contemporary subject in the conflict between self-searching and world loss. The talk examines this artistic development in my work. Against my biographical background, I trace an arc from, from religious glass designs via the intermediary subject of the angel to the contemporary figure on the springboard. And finally, from 2016, it leads, it leads into the idea of my 80 capriccios and the turbulences of the self. 
This is an installation of 80 backlit glass artworks, which speaks of uncertainty and mental disturbance, but also of the enduring humanity of mankind in times of social transformation. Aha, good. As a young chartered surveyor, I was employed in Canterbury and my daily route took me past Canterbury Cathedral. The stained glass windows there taught me a sense of wonder. As a result of these experiences and from the very beginning as a young artist and an, and an aspiring glass painter, I sought sources of inspiration in religious art. I focused my creative work on the design of windows for sacred buildings in dialogue with the people who use them and live in them. Both religion and art reflect the rootedness of man in the world. Religious pictures and the artistic narrative do not analyze. They do not strive for clarity, but open up the gaze to the ambiguous complex of meaning in human life. This inner connection between art and religion forms the starting point to which I, as a young artist, turned to stained glass as an art form that places the creation of images primarily in the service of a spiritual awareness and symbolization of the world. And this operates with light, with color, and with narration on the border between the space in the here and now and the transcendental other. Against this background, I made a conscious decision to enter into, into the tradition of the glass painters in the cathedral workshops of medieval times, not only in relation to their fundamental craftsmanship skills, which have scarcely changed over the centuries, but also with regard to their biblical and religious border crossing European pictorial programs. And here you see a 12th century medallion in Canterbury, the Magi following the star. It's simple, it's colorful, it's telling a story. So in 1976, I began to study architectural glass at Swansea School of Art in Wales. The decision with, with regard to this change of career was the result of my visiting an exhibition by the artist and glass painter Amber Hiscott and my coming into contact with modern architectural glass, which had opened up traditional stained glass windows to the contemporary pictorial language of the 20th century. After finishing my studies in 1978, I settled with my young family as a freelance artist in my own studio in my hometown in Bath. My startup exhibition there resulted in my first two commissions for churches, the parish churches of St. Bartholomew's and St. Stephen's, both in Bath. In 1980, I completed the St. Stephen's Centenary Memorial window. In fact, it was the third commission that I completed. And this commission, in the making of this commission, I discovered the need for client dialogue. Um, the first designs that I did for this, for this window uh, were somehow based on what I understood as my, from my training, that you're given a window, you, you create a design, you present the design, you get a commission. And it didn't work that way. And I had to rework the design and, uh, and engage in a dialogue with my client, the church community. And this is a process which I've uh, had to develop. You learn how to do it. And it's, it's incredibly important. But in this window from 1980, you see typical trademark features of mine, drawing with the lead, the Hartley Woods lively streaky glass, a single motif filling the window. The expressive figural study of the martyrdom of St. Stephen depicted in this east window already signals the balance between narration and abstraction in the pictorial language of my work. Perhaps my most famous single work to this day 
is the 1984 Daily Bread window for Durham Cathedral. And as you can see, it's an aerial view of the Last Supper. The brief, which was given by uh, Dr. Peter Belts, the then Dean of Durham, was the shortest I've ever had in my career. And I'll read it to you in full. The interpenetration of the divine and the secular economies. A wonderful brief. So here in my father's birth town and following a, a wide ranging theological dialogue with my clients, I developed the encounter of the secular and the sacred spheres in glass by means of the subject of the Last Supper, the transformation of physical food into spiritual food. This started a career long interest in transformation, in transition and in the journey all determining factors in my future work. On the right, you can see the original design and you can see the, how the window uh, changed through those discussions. And I draw attention to Judas in the design who's second up on the right and deleted with a, a black cross. But in the actual window, he's second up on the left and a slightly departing and green uh, figure. The tension between abstraction and symbolically laden narrative, as expressed in this window, results from an intensive study as a, as a student and young glass artist of the different attitudes towards modern stained glass in both Germany and Britain. While on the one hand, the design of religious glass in new churches built in Germany after the Second World War, for example, in the badly bombed Ruhr region, aimed at a break with the past, which allowed for the emergence into the modern age. Whilst by contrast, the post-war British church art and architecture scene focused more on continuity and further developed the poetical worldview of the arts and crafts movement. I undertook study trips through both countries I made a personal acquaintance with Johannes Schreiter and Ludwig Schaffraff, two German masters of modern stained glass, as well as, for example, the painter John Piper, who was particularly influential with regard to glass painting in Britain after the war. However, it was the painter and graphic artist Georg Meistermann who had the most marked influence on my work. Unfortunately, I was never able to meet him. He, he died before the first of my study tours, but uh, I made a point to visit uh, dozens of, of his windows and he was a huge, has been a huge influence on, on my life. The commission for the large window shown here in Emmanuel Church, Islington, um, um, excuse me a moment. Yes, I show you this window, but the point of showing this co commission is that it points to other things that happen. Um, when you're handling a commission, you're often asked to do something. You can decide whether to do it or not, whether it's the right thing to do. But you can also um, pay attention to the rest of the building. And in this case, um, I was asked, in addition to making this window, to make leaded lights, diamond quarries, for a, a string of, of windows in the side rooms of the church uh, um, adjacent to this worshipping area. And of course, I replied that I don't do diamond quarries, um, but I um, was happy to offer them to make uh, angel windows using the, the type of glass and lead that you would use for diamond quarries. And shortly, I'll show you some examples of, of that. Um, for me, the duty of my art to serve others in no way contradicts my individual development as an artist. Instead, I, I like to create a lively exchange. It takes place and in which artistic powers and inspiration are enriched by perspectives from the parish concerned as well as the collective memories of the site of the commission and the surrounding region. Against this background, I do not see ongoing discussions with clients and commissioning bodies, 
decision making committees and last but not least the church communities as a disruptive factor but as a valuable element to be welcomed in the design process. So in this period of around 1989 I was developing these skills um, which, which can't in a way be taught but you need to be aware of the need to have them uh, and um, I think if you spend 30% of your time on a commission in what you might call client management, talking to the client, having a dialogue, sharing ideas. And if you don't visit the church several times uh, before you, you even get the commission, um, these are all the things you need to do. And this theme I take forward into 91 to St. Bartholomew's Church in Sheffield. Here you see some very small little insertions into the wall. It's a new church and I was working with the architect and the main commission is above our heads. It, it's a big uh, glass um, uh, form above the, uh, immediately above the worshipping area. But the it's not so that you expand the commission, but, but you need to be to give good advice to your client. And this window, uh, where you see a white angel, um, this window uh, is facing the congregation in the morning services. It's behind the altar, facing east. So the congregation would have had tremendous problems with glare of the sun, but it was even worse than that because the window is elevated and looking down through the window, you could see the car park of the church. Um, so again, it's a case of offering to the church to do something to solve architectural issues as well as, as, well as providing the spiritual and the aesthetic um, things which, which churches require. So a white angel, uh, a very large window, nearly three meters high on the left hand side, large pieces of white opal glass. And um, earlier on, I, I mentioned Georg Meistermann. He made a lot of windows just in white. So you see from the selection of the windows I'm showing you, I'm trying to tell you little stories of things that happened through commissions. St. Mary Tory in Bradford-on-Avon, a, a very small wayfarers church up high above the town of, of Bradford-on-Avon. Um, and this is the first occasion where I had an, an anonymous client. So every commission has a different pathway. You can never predict it and you can learn from previous um, commissions and experiences, but there's always going to be these surprises. So an, an anonymous client, um, I, I had dialogues through a third person, the, the, uh, the priest in charge, but uh, I never met the client before uh, the window was completed. Um, it, it was surprising because up till then I developed the need to have dialogue with the church community and now I didn't have it. So I was cast onto my, onto my own ideas and I produced a window I'm, I'm very pleased with. It's a very small uh, east window in a very small uh, wayfaring ch uh, church. Um, I had great pleasure to meet the, the client um, several years later. And I can't quite remember the circumstances in, in which we met, but she, but she invited me for coffee anyway. And I've talked about angels a little bit, and I'll show you some now. On the left, you see one of the windows from the church, Emmanuel Church in Islington in London, where I was asked to make diamond quarries. And I made angels using the, those uh, rolled textured glasses um, that you're familiar with. Um, but one of the windows, one of the rooms was a rather special one. It was used by the priest for meetings and so on. And the angel in the center is again the center from a three light uh, window where I chose to use an opal white glass to give it a, a more superior and deeper feeling 
um, for, for this rather more special room. And on the right, you see one of the angels, um, which I used in Andal School Chapel, one of the commissions I'm going to show you shortly. So here's some angels. And again, I'll make another jump. And just in this one image, mention secular works, because of course I've made hundreds of secular uh, stained glass windows. And I'll just show you a few of these. On the left, you see a, a dovecot for a wealthy client in around Bath in England, um, in, in, in the house. And in the center, you can see a front door and a, a tall window to the side of the front door in a beautiful uh, part of Scotland. And on the right, you'll see two round-headed windows at the top for a private house. In the middle, an office building in London. And underneath, you can see uh, some things that look a bit like bicycle wheels, because this was for a, a shop that sold bicycles in London called Velo. And the very bottom right, a, a front door for a house in Bristol. Secular work was never a great priority for me in, in forming my career and um, creating the base for, for my reputation. But it's bread and butter work and you have to please the client. There's adventures to be had. And I've always enjoyed uh, making uh, secular architectural glass works. So my life had a big change in the year 2000. And all the images that you see in the second half of the talk are, are windows that were made in this second part of my career when I moved to Frauenau in Bavaria. And you see a part of the village of Frauenau, a, a glassmaker's community. You can see in the center of the photograph one uh, glass factory chimney. There are three glass factory chimneys in Frauenau today two of which are working with mouth-blown glass production. Um, Fraunau also has a uh, buildwork Fraunau, a center in Europe for the teaching of all aspects of glass art, as well as other uh, art fields, and a, a highly recommended place for um, uh, students to, to, to find out about what courses are, are offered there. Moving to the region on the fringes of Bavaria, uh, near the border with the Czech Republic, with its traditional glass production, challenged me as an individual and a glass artist with completely new possibilities, but also with the collapse of all that was known and familiar, notably with the expectation to be called upon as a matter of course as a stained glass artist for church communities in the United Kingdom. However, and conversely, in this new artistic region, I profited from my integration into the Bavarian scene of independent artists working in glass and with their closely interlinked international networks, as well as the access it afforded me to the regional industrial glassworks culture. I exchanged the potential to work with English glass from Hartley Woods, which in fact had closed down in 1997 for proximity to Lambert's glassworks in Waldsassen, some two hours drive for me in Frauenau. Lambert's is one of the world's remaining glassworks for mouth blown colored glass. The even colors of Lambert's glass and in particular the multi-layered overlay or flashed glass sheets suggested a more painterly pictorial approach. I developed this in an expressive and masterly degree by using enamel paints and silver stain and the now, now and then nowadays rarely used acid etching technique. The removal of, of colored layers of the glass surface surface with hydrofluoric acid. This new orientation with regard to the raw materials was accompanied by a focus on the human figure combined with a more ambiguous narration. Yeah. 
But one commission that I took with me when I moved to Bavaria was the uh, commission for Andal School Chapel, which I executed over the years 2000 to 2004. And here I show you on the left uh, four of the designs uh, photographed behind glass, so not a great photo. But you also on the right, you'll see four of the cartoons. Um, my cartoons have always been full size, of course, and full color. Um, I've always liked to color my cartoons, which is something also that Georg Meistermann uh, did. I spent a period of time having a residency in the school, in, the, in this public school. And well, the years since the turn of the millennium are associated with my great church window cycles or schemes. And this 36 window commission eventually became 42 stained glass windows for the school chapel. They exist in the shadow of the monumental east windows by John Piper. The title of my scheme is The Colours of Order. Along the southern nave, my series tells episodes from the story of the creation, the creation of order from chaos through nature and the seasons and the elements up to the apocalypse. And on the north side, I develop the story of the passion from its roots in the Old Testament. This is all seen as a reflection of a school life that is based on order and in need of color and narrative content. From all of those windows, I'll just show you um, a, a few from left to right. The north windows, the Old Testament, Moses and the law, then Exodus, the flight from Egypt, and the two south windows here from the creation, the sun and the moon, and the order of, the, of plants, let there be. And here, again, following the creation, two of the seasons, spring and summer, the separation of dry land and water, and the creation out of the void, and God said. Oundle School has four houses each named after a saint. And in the porch, entry to the chapel, there are four windows. So the, the four windows each was dedicated to those four saints. And here you see St. George and St. Catherine. Stylistically, in its semi-abstract and simultaneously scenic narrative language, what I've just shown you, the, the earlier colors of order, relates to the spiritual journey, um, which is the title of the work at the Church of the Immaculate Conception in Spink Hill, near Sheffield. A cycle of eight lancet windows, it's in a Catholic parish church. Both this scheme and the earlier one for Andal marked a transition to new poetic, abstract, figurative work for me. And this is also represented by the latest cycle in Breitenberg on the border between Lower Bavaria and Austria, a scheme which is even more narrative and which I'll show you shortly. Working on a scheme is very different to making an, in, an individual window. A scheme requires a structure. And this can only evolve slowly, and it evolves in dialogue with the priest and the church community. A scheme can be holistic, as when, for example, Schreiter fills an, an entire building with one color, one mood, one motif, and creates a, a deeply spiritual space. Or it can have a more detailed theological base, 
and be progressive as one approaches to the East End. And it is on this latter principle that, that both the schemes for Andal and Spink Hill are based. Oh, just to go back, uh, this photograph was, it's very unusual to see stained glass at night, but a parishioner was able to take the photograph and illuminate the windows from the inside and sent me the photograph. And I think it's one of my favorite uh, of all time photographs of my work. So I'll show you just four of those eight windows now. Here's the first two. And another two. I've already mentioned Breitenberg in Bavaria. And here I show you two photographs, a before photograph and an after photograph. The before photograph allows you to see the size of this um, Baroque altar. It's enormous and it's covered in gold. And uh, my notes here tell me, I'm going to tell you about the yellow and the blue fight. Um, the, uh, I was invited to produce, <coughs> oh, please excuse me, to produce designs, but I made a decision right at the beginning that the altar has tremendous significance and that I would use a blue as a single color, one color blue. But when I came to present the designs on the first occasion, I was blocked by a listed building officer who insisted that the windows should be made using yellow glass. And his point was that the, the altar is yellow, it's golden, and the windows must be as well. And I countered by saying that, that if the windows were yellow, the, the altar would just bleed into them and lose, lose its integrity. Whereas this soft and surprisingly quite warm blue glass brings the altar forward. But he didn't, he wasn't persuaded. So then I asked if we could have a scaffolding and I climbed the scaffolding in front of one of these windows holding uh, full size Lambert sheets of glass, um, approximately a meter by 70 to 80 centimeters in every color, a range of blues and a range of yellows included. And the listed building officer was still not satisfied and blocked the commission in blue. So then I suggested that I would make a sample panel for one of these rec sorry, one of these squares. They're almost a meter square. Um, and I would put it there and the congregation and the priest and all these other people could uh, experience it over a longer period of time. And eventually, after almost two years, I met the, the whole group again. And with, with the bad grace, the uh, listed building officer said that I'd worn him down and that I could go ahead with the commission, but, but that I, was, but I wasn't right, um, that he thinks yellow glass would have been better. Those of you who work with glass know that yellow is a very difficult colouring glass. It can be uh, a weak colour. Um, um, well, but it can also be an aggressively acidic colour which is more appropriate for advertising at a, a petrol filling station, for example. Um, so it's a very difficult color to use, maybe with the exception of silver stain. But my prime argument was the integrity of the altar and, and the blue. Um, please make your own decision on that. But um, I'll show you the window shortly. Here are cartoons. These don't need to be colored because they're all blue. So I, I didn't need to color them in particular. The theme of these windows is the Easter readings. And it was a very interesting project for me. And assembling all these images, I realized that art, you can put uh, images from different time zones together in one image. So in the second from the left window, you can see at the bottom the Annunciation and, and at the top you can see the crucifixion, um, but all in one window spanning a period of, of time. 
you also see in the uh, third from the left, again, the Last Supper. These are the windows. This is an opaque um, blue glass. It's, it's, a, it's a double flash. It's blue, a, a very th fine layer of blue, which has been acid etched, onto a dense opal white. And the reason for that is to, to stop the glare of the sun. The window is at the east end, and in the morning services, the congregation uh, only had the glare of the sun in their eyes. So the, the opal, the opaque in this case, uh, glass uh, blocks the glare. Just a very small amount of transparent in, enamel color added. So I'm explaining the way different commissions can evolve. Burke Hampstead School um, had a, a new building, and this was to include a new school chapel. And this was the first site visit. You've got all the architectural drawings, but now you're just seeing this metal um, structure, and you've got to visualize from the drawings into this structure what's going to happen here. It's a complicated space. And just to jump to the, uh, the end product, you see that the chapel is contained in that uh, copper clad uh, form which interrupts into a space. And in fact, the space is open to the ground floor and it's a refectory for the school. And they look up to see the window from, from the refectory on the second floor. The floor of the chapel itself is at the bottom of the blue glass. And those texts which you see underneath the blue glass um, are under the floor level on the other side. It's complicated. You, you'll get an idea, though. I'll, I'll talk you through it a little bit. Again, here's the cartoons, uh, full size, in this case, colored uh, drawings. Um, for those of you who, who like these things, um, I love these angels. These are Bavarian angels now. Uh, you see this type of uh, just a head with wings in, in many churches around my part of Bavaria. And this is a very complicated commission. The, the windows uh, go from floor to ceiling and from wall to wall. They're high up. So the, the whole installation had to be fireproof soundproof and impact proof and the, the colored glass is laminated onto onto these thick layers of float glass so this is not a commission to to be uh, made in my studio and i went to D a derek studio in germany to have these uh, windows uh, made you go there as the artist and you are um, invited if it's your decision um, but i like to do the painting myself and to put on the waxes and the other resists for the acid etching and although i do my own acid etching in derrick's you're not allowed to do that they do it for you but they do it beautifully and, and very quickly and once you've completed the painting you leave and then they uh, complete the firings and do all the lamination and prepare everything for the installation And this is the window as seen from the chapel side. It's difficult to photograph this window because behind me is, a, is, an, is an equal sized window with daylight coming in. So it's, it's front lit on this side, it's, but it has to be visible on the inside of the chapel as well as from that refectory on the, on the outside of the chapel complicated things to, to resolve all of these, but a tremendous uh, learning and, and pleasure to work on them. Now I'm going to make another digression towards uh, autonomous work, uh, free hanging uh, wall lamps, very most of them, 
Uh, this is um, Lambert's, whole sheets of Lambert's glass, acid etched and painted. In the new millennium, alongside the creation of church windows, I began experimental work on secular glass panels, auton autonomous glass panels for exhibitions. In the transition from my religious oeuvre to secular works, angels played an important part. And whether earnest or standing or flying, mediating between the here and now and the heavens of other worlds. My exhibitions had titles like Visogna Engel, which translates as spoiled angels. Um, it, this was, these are expressive painting of figures um, created for exhibitions from 2006 or onwards. In solo and group exhibitions in Germany and in England and in the Czech Republic, Frequently in, in ecclesiastical contexts and spaces, such as the Stained Glass Museum at Ely Cathedral, my angels became a recurring theme. Angel figures mediate between man's existence in the world and is being cast arbitrarily into the world on the one hand, and the prospect of other transcendental spheres on the other. Moreover, the figure of the angel also forms a thematic link in my work, which leads from my religious art into an examination of ambivalent characteristics of the contemporary subject. With paintings and glass wall paint pieces, and later you'll see some water jet cut panels. Um, th these artworks made solo exhibitions. One was called Andere Himmel, Other Heavens, in the State Gallery of Degendorf in 2008. And the motive of the angel led into the study of the figure of the Per Eternis, as the psychoanalyst Louise Franz described him with reference to the figure of the little prince and its author Antoine de saint Expure, and how this figure can easily be transferred to a typical young, probably male personality. It revolves around the center figure of the eternal youth with his self-centered focus unable and unwilling to make decisions, floating without setting a foot on the ground, a fascinating, engaging creature that exists in delusions of grandeur and at the same time in profound insecurity. Just think of Peter Pan. Another theme that I explored over these years was wrestling with angels. Um, and these are four windows from the Wrestling with Angels series. This refers to uh, Jacob at the river Yabok, where he was both wounded and blessed. It's in Genesis. The story fascinates me. Um, wrestling is quite an interesting uh, activity because it, invol it involves very close physical contact and this physical contact can appear um, uh, hugging, uh, kissing, um, very intimate, but, it, but it's also dangerous um, as um, Jacob uh, experienced. But in the process it involves the potential, the risk involves the potential for transformation. These are Peraternus figures, the everlasting youth. And my exhibitions could combine paintings, in this case on paper. You see three paintings on the left. And then in the corner, you see one glass panel back lit. And now I introduce you to a float glass water jet cut figure. 
all on the same theme of wrestling with the angels. The tin side of float glass has a wonderful reaction with silver stain and transforms a utilitarian and inexpensive material into something of great beauty. And here you see clusters of these figures on the left for my exhibition in the Victoria Art Gallery in Bath. And on the right, uh, two diving figures actually set up on a very high post over the, over the river in Frauenau, in the glass gardens of Frauenau. These silver stained um, and uh, float glass windows, I adopt the same technique as acid etching, uh, um, a, a flashed glass, but it's actually in reverse. You're not removing color, but you're removing the tin. So if you remove the tin and then completely cover the sheet of glass with silver stain, you get varying tones of, of this beautiful amber color. I mentioned right at the beginning the figure standing on the diving board and, and on the right you see a figure on a diving board and uh, it's a moment in time and we don't know if this figure will has the courage to make this high dive and if he does what will happen to him. I like this uh, uh, very ambivalent moment where the figure um, has to make a decision or, or not. And these images were from the exhibition at the Ely Stained Glass Museum. Uh, on the left, uh, float glass, silver stained, and with um, text put on with the, with the Dremel, with the flexible shaft, and on the right, acid etched Lambert's flashed glass. Ladders often appear behind my figures, suggesting uh, ways out or alternatives, uh, uh, other journeys, uh, but unseen by the, by the subject. I mentioned earlier on that I had access to blown glass factories and I've um, fairly often found beautiful vases which I've painted. Now they have a, pa a glass painting tradition in Bavaria, but it's a completely different painting technique to that used by stained glass artists. But of course I don't know their technique and I apply normal um, glass painters technique to, to vases. And here's two such vases and in, the, and in the next slide you'll see how they look in an exhibition. So here you see a run of, of, of these vases. They're about 30, 35 uh, centimeters square with, a, with an opal, uh, a white opal on the inside. I found these very inexpensively uh, in a glass factory and I painted nearly a hundred of them and the vast majority of them were sold. And I realized that this, um, that, that People like my glass painting perhaps, but they also like to buy an object which is not only a piece of art, but it's useful, their vases. This is one room from seven in an exhibition in Deggendorf. And these exhibitions, you have to create a lot of work. And one of, one of my methods was to create one overarching theme for each room. This is two views of one room where the same image, exactly the same image, was created in every available technique that I had in glass painting, as well as uh, painting, paintings on the wall. And this is another view of, of that exhibition. On the wall behind you'll see uh, paintings and drawings on paper. And on these th three plinths at the front, you see blown glass forms painted in what's known as the Graal technique. 
you you paint a form and then it's uh, picked up by the glass blower and reheated and on onward blown and in this case opened as a to create these big plates these are all glass painting skills which i could develop because i was living in a glass producing area and before we move on to the next chapter i i show you this um the one occasion where i acted as a curator of an exhibition it's a magnificent exhibition it, its title was 50 vases 50 artists and you can see that all around this table there's one rather ugly vase a, a very large flower pot in shape and the offer was that we would send uh, one of these vases to artists if, if they would then make it into their own artwork and send it back and of course those artists were primarily glass artists of every type, um, but but not only uh, they could be wood sculptors, ceramicists, painters, every type of artist, and everyone who was asked if if they wanted one uh, took it and worked it in 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 all these diverse ways, and sent them back. It was a collaboration between Buildwork Fraunau, the Summer Academy I mentioned earlier, and the Eich Factory, who made the vases and also made all the uh, glassware that you see set in front here. The exhibition was intended for one glass museum, but very rapidly got snaffled up by all the glass museums across Germany. And in addition, artists, new artists were flooding in. And I don't know the final number from memory, but it was over 80 uh, that the, the as the exhibition grew so i've had a i've had my moments of great fun uh, working with glass in most extraordinary ways so i'll finish with a few things now um perth united reformed church this was another learning curve for me um the first designs i did were figurative i was i'm in the figurative part of my life then and um, but of course the united reformed church um, were not enthusiastic for figurative solutions so i had to do a second series but the main reason i've included it in the lecture again is is for those students there to realize that when you get a commission from from a church you need to invite them to your studio to see the design to see the cartoon and for sure to see the windows in the studio before they're installed in the church um, and a, a delegation will come to you and and you enjoy to meet them in on your base on your ground you've met them previously in on in their church uh, but now you invite them to see what's happening this gives them a sense of ownership uh, and they can also uh, um they can also explain the window to their colleagues how it was made why it was constructed this way and so on so this is um P perth is one of the church groups that have visited the studio this is my studio in graz and i'll, ch I'll show you quickly the windows for ireland Rahim Church, a Catholic church. And again, I've chosen it as much because of, of the extraordinary nature of the commission, because this was a church that had fallen into disrepair. And a nearby very wealthy man said to the church, you give me the church, I will restore it and renovate it. And I'll do whatever I want to do in it. And then I'll give it back to you. And of course, the, the church agreed to it, but it gave me as the stained glass artist the most extraordinary experience. I, um, I was invited by the architect and he and I went to uh, um, Raheen and, and met the donor, the client, uh, and visited the church. And I was given an extraordinarily short period of time to design 16 windows. Um, probably about a quarter of the time I would like to have. And I only had the architect and at arm's length, probably the, the wealthy donor. Um, and then when the designs were finished, again, the architect and I traveled to, to his house, close to Rahim Church. 
And I think in something like half an hour, the designs were presented and I was told to go home and make them. And I was also informed that I had approximately one third of the time I would usually like to have to make such a scheme of windows. Um, so this was uh, um, almost kamikaze in its, in, in its haste. Everything was, um, everything else I had in hand was stopped. The, the cartoons were drawn, the glass was bought, and I was working all hours to complete these windows in, in record time. And we just managed to install them before Christmas um, uh, of, it would have been 2014, um, in, uh, in the most appalling uh, weather, freezing cold and blowing wind every day. It was um, quite an experience. But uh, the installation was, e was even more difficult. I do my own installations, usually, but I, I take a team with me. So we were a German, an Englishman, and a Czech working here on scaffolds, on ladders, on the inside, on the outside. But we were working uh, um, uh, all hours of the night and day, as much in the night because it was dark by four o'clock. It was the shortest time of the year. And the problem we had is the church had been largely renovated. And every time we made dust and, and all those other things, we, we had major problems to, to keep all the dust away. So it was a fight on every front. But yes, I'll quickly show you these windows. There's, uh, um, the focus of them is, of course, in the lower section. The sills are very high, but the, the windows are beautiful. Um, I'm speeding up a bit because I think I'm overrunning the time slightly. The, I'm showing you this image, which is what the bottom of the window, the Pietà window, and the top of the same window. So though the imagery is in the lower section, the beauty, the poetry, and the work, the etching, and, and everything else has to be equal all the way through the window. And St. Mary's Church Sheffield was my most recent project. And I, the details I show you on the right, um, for those of you who <coughs> are working with glass, you might be able to recognize that this is now sandblasted, not acid etched, because the, my opportunity to work in, in acid etching for health and safety reasons was, was diminishing. So I had to adapt my skills to, to sandblasting. The west window has a very small window right at the apex. You'll see it in the next slide when we come back to it. Um, and that's what this dove is. It's from that very small window at the top. And that would have glared terribly. So I wanted to also add that to the commission, as well as these seven lights underneath. So the, the west window is, is on the choir balcony. And underneath, is the entry across these seven small windows. So on the left here, you can see the, uh, the vicar, the bishop and the glass artist at the dedication service. And I've included this cake on the right, again, for students, um, because they won't teach you this at art school. You need to learn how to cut cakes because at these dedication services, they're a community event and somebody's going to cook a cake and ice it like this. And they're going to come to the artist and they say, can you please cut the cake? And you have to learn how to cut cakes. And you can see the west window there. And um, I made sure in the cutting of this cake that I gave a, a, a bit of that window to the vicar and the architect and the, the people from the steering committee. So now at the end, I'm going to quickly show you the 80 caprices and the turbulences of the self. Um, just fiddle with my notes a moment here. This um, was a contemporary act of homage to the cycle of 80 etchings, Los Capricios by Francisco Goya. And I was prompted to, to make these by Salvador Dali. He reworked and overpainted the Goya series and I considered this to be a most insensitive action. 
So I wanted to make my own Mark Angus Capriccio series. And I played with watercolors and a little bit with wood engraving. But um, I eventually decided to explore the boundaries of my own metier in glass, in glass painting, just as Goya had done with copper engraving. These are colorful glass paintings and they experiment with everything and anything that brings color and form into and onto flat glass. They exploit traditional enamel painting, they're light and transparent, or they can be with black leaded contours and scraffito, complemented by brilliant silver stain. My spontaneous paintings integrate the techniques of sandblasting, and some figures are created using wheel engraving. It uses stencils, applique, and multi-layered lamination. The glass painting tradition contributes mouth-blown antique and picturesquely etched flashed glass, but otherwise any sort of glass background seems to have been permitted. Glass which collects in the stocks of glazers workshops, window float glass, and even variously patterned bathroom and technically structured glass, sometimes cut and glued, sprayed, and painted many times. I made this series of 80 windows probably for myself. Um, I, I was now of retirement age uh, in, in 19, and I wanted to, um, to, to really show off what I could do with, with glass um, in every way. The titles were important to me, and I'll tell you some of the titles. A Room of My Own Alone, and some suggested advertising motifs, Accelerate Next, Accelerating Transformation, Advance to Blue. These picture titles echoing the calls from Hewlett Packard and, and Marlborough. In this way, I took up the old artistic and religious subjects of ambivalence and ambiguity, transition and transformation, and precariousness in keeping with the times. In fact, some are expressed in reference to modern forms of religious practice in quirky titles such as Disappointment is also an epiphany. I attempt to get to the heart of current discourse with intuitive attention and in a breathtaking manner, especially re regarding the figure of the enterprising self and the neoliberal transformations of contemporary culture. And I'll read you the titles of some of these from left to right. Now he was dreaming in blue. Growing up is not easy. The strong pull of gravity increasing with every vertigo inch. Most of the time, truth is just opinion. Overinflated economy. I, I don't have the title for the middle one. Um, mine, everything I own. And on the right, protected, secure, hidden, inviolate. Look at me. Can't you hear me? He whispered. A crumpled sheet of cellophane dropped into her brain. Looking down instead of looking up. Three quarters over and nothing untoward had happened. I think in these works, I found a perfect balance between poetry and abstraction, which happens to be the title of this talk. Um, I'll leave you with three very recent panels. These completed in March 2021, full-size uh, Lambert sheets. So thank you for your attention and thank you to the uh, director of the Ely Stained Glass Museum, Jasmine Allen, for the invitation. Good. Thank you, Mark. I know you can't see our faces, but I know that there were lots of smiles, especially as you were reading out those titles, and you would hear the sound of applause now if we were all in a physical room. Oh, thank you. <laughs> now, that was a wonderful journey uh, from the powerful symbolism of, of the glass in your churches that you've made right up to the kind of very expressive energetic autonomous panels we've, we've seen so much so thank you if you have questions for mark and you haven't already done so please pop them in the q a are you happy to take some questions mark oh yes 
Fantastic. Um, I will kick off while people are thinking. I know we've got a couple that, that people have asked. I noticed that in, in your church, the work, work you've produced for churches, um, you've produced glass, as you pointed out, for very Baroque interiors. And some of the early glass you showed us was uh, for very different modern church interiors, concrete and uh, different size windows and shapes and things. And I wondered if you had a favourite kind of architectural style or, or church interior that you like to work with, or whether you just went into whatever was there and worked with that space. Uh, Jasmine, it's a, an interesting uh, question, and I'm going to bat it into a completely different space. Um, what I'm looking for with a commission uh, could be um, a converted industrial building that's being used in an inner city church, uh, or it, it could be a, a gem of 12th century architecture or contemporary architecture. But what I'm looking for is, is, is the congregations, the, the people who use the churches, uh, and I want contact with them to feel what, what, what I can bring to them. Uh, perhaps not what they want, but what they need, uh, what could be of service to them in, um, to, to make their, uh, the house that they're in uh, uh, suitable for the function and the purposes that they have. So it's never really been um, an issue for me about the, the church, the building, the architecture. Um, it's and more it, about the community. Yes, it is. And it, it, equally, it, it doesn't really matter. I mean, an east window it, it is, is a focal point. But um, a small side chapel window, a little window, where you can create a space where uh, somebody could, could be alone and, and experience something, a transformation um, in, in their private sphere. An, an almost invisible window could be just as thrilling uh, to, to me as a glass artist as the the big um, prestigious uh, grand east windows and so on. Does that answer the question? No, that has, and I think um, you probably it probably was clear to me actually in the way that you were talking about the commissions, because you really did enjoy that process and that journey. It seemed like, which was fantastic. Um, Alison asks, you, you do have a lot of work in religious buildings and, and she wondered if you practice a religion yourself. Um, obviously you've shown some interest in some of the religious themes, uh, Jacob wrestling with the angel. Um, is that something you want to comment on? I think, again, the, the question, I, I, I bounce it in a, in a different way, um, Alison. Thank you for the question. Um, you know, I've been asked to, do, to make work for synagogues and um, uh, 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 re religions which I obviously can't uh, be a part of. And for me, it's a matter of understanding the space. Um, concerning, uh, we in, in the West, um, religion and religious art surrounds us. It's part of our cultural um, we're born into it, and and these stories um, are are ones which which we learn. Certainly, in my generation, we learnt it through school and Sunday school, and and going to church. We learnt it through being singing in the choir. Um, so we we absorbed it all. Um, so for me, it's it's it doesn't have to be about um doctrine it, or anything like that for me it's about spirituality and i think that's a common denominator um, and it's it's where artists and religion can very comfortably uh, meet Thank um, you. my wife is behind me pointing out that i should also emphasize narrative uh because the the, the storytelling um 
aspect of it and the retelling and the retelling of stories and finding new interpretations of the same story um, that's that's how our culture evolves and and how we interrelate as, as humans in in our world so the church is the is the place where people are seeking narratives and understanding but they're also uh, hoping to, to, to um, they're not seeking meaning in that sense because they they still want uh, mystery and awe, and uh, and so these these things co combine in such a beautiful way in stained glass. Thank you, Mark. Um, Italia asks: Is there a particular commission that you've undertaken that changed your outlook on future commissions or changed your approach to your work? Uh, well, I've probably given some hints that almost every commission does that because you engage uh, with it. Um, um, let me think. Probably earlier in my career, when I talked about St. Stephen's and, and, and dealing with clients and, and with Durham sitting at the foot of a leading theologian, Probably these experiences set the die for me, um, and they were the uh, transformative and inspirational base on which I could then continue. Um, I'm seeking adventure, um, and the adventure I seek it, it, it's not about um, it, it's about meeting people and meeting new challenges. Um, so the in a sense the more um, difficult the situation, the more interesting it can be. Hmm. Um, Debbie notes that you used lead as a drawing tool in, in some of your earlier work, and then your more recent work on the autonomous panels is, is clearly working, as you said, on one sheet of, of, yes. of Lambert's glass. Um, is there something more freeing about your, your expression and working on the single pane of glass. Do, do you want to say a bit about that? She's asking mm. um, about the conscious decision not to use lead. Well, you know, it all came at this connect point of 2000 when uh, I had been using uh, uh, Hartleywood streaky glass and I had a good command of that. You had all the lights and the dark and all the colors blending. So you were sorting glass and, and finding how to, to cut it and, and what to bring together. And it, you took lead to bring them together. But when I um, had the opportunity to, to buy Lambert's glass, flashed glass, and could start developing my acid etching skills. And this combined with the possibility in the ice factory where I could set up perfectly safely with an air extraction system, um, uh, five full-size sheets of Lambert's glass to be etching at the same time. Um, so they could etch slowly and I could watch what was happening, stop the process, put some more resists on, put some concentrated acid here and there. And so gradually the need for construction, if you like the necessary evil of, of lead, um, it, it, it slowly disappeared. Um, and uh, um, even when, uh, so an autonomous panel, you can, do, you can get it all in one, in one sheet of glass. You can get a range of colors. The image on my computer screen, I hope it's maybe on yours, you've, you've got uh, white, you've got yellow, orange and red, all in one piece of glass with the black. Um, so there's no need to break it down. But and then if you think back to the that German series I showed you, the blue windows, um, there needs to be some leads there, but now they they just become uh, they're large sheets of glass now etched and the leads are, ju are just holding those large sheets of glass together. They're not themselves drawing the, the figure, whereas the very early piece for St. Stephen's in Bath, uh, the, the, the whole of the drawing is done using thick and thin leads and using the lead um, also as a false lead on the surface of the, of the glass. Um, so that was just a process for me. Mm. Um, Today, um, lead has, has fallen out of favor. 
because lamination is now a, a primary uh, construction technique where you glue glass onto a, a, a carrier float glass. Um, and these, uh, and lead now, uh, I think in many people's mind, has a very dated quality. It, it looks old fashioned and is not attractive. So I think if I was a young person today, um, I would for sure want to do acid etching, silver, um, uh, um, silver stain, uh, sandblasting, and lamination as, as the main techniques and m move away from lead completely. And a lot of those processes really uh, focus around the colour and the quality of the glass itself. It's about making that glass sing, mm. adding to it, taking it away. Um, but there's that inherent colour. And Joanne was wondering if there's a particular colour palette you enjoy working with. She noticed that there's a lot of red, yellow and blue as the kind of dominant colours mm. in your work. Yes, and very little green or brown or purple. Um, Red is red is the image we have in front of us now. It, it's a powerful colour. Um, I've never made a red window. Uh, I can make a panel in red, but I've never made a full panel in red. It, I think it would be frightening um, and and disturbing. Um, uh, yellow. We've talked about that as a on a big scale in glass. It can be very difficult to use. So a yellow. You, you've seen some yellow panel, panels in silver stain and you can see yellow added in there's always yellow added in because you can stain in uh, very easily or or you can add transparent colored enamels in very easily if the glass doesn't take the stain um, and and yellow doesn't have any dark it's a bright color without any uh, depth of tone so it can be added to anything very easily um, blue I look at blues. Um, blue can be very cold, but the Breitenberg blue isn't cold. It, it, it's, it's actually a surprisingly warm uh, color. Um, so there's a lot of blues and you need to find the, the ones that, that, that work. Um, and since greens, you met sorry, I was, I was gonna say greens and browns. Uh, th these are earthy colors and I'm much more up in the air and uh, these, more spiritual colors, I think, are not, uh, they are in the primary uh, color range, probably. Yeah. You're up in the air with the angels that feature so much in, in the work. Yes. And and the blues um, is, is an interesting one because uh, David mentions here, and this is always a sticking point when you're talking about artistic influences, but he noticed that your, your later work reminds him of Chagall, who of course, um, did some quite wonderful windows using blues, mm. as have uh, several other kind of modern artists. Um, and I'd, I'd throw out there as well some of the, the more symbolic uh, ways in which you're, you were illustrating creation and uh, the crossing of the Red Sea reminded me of some of the work that Piper and Raintins did, say, for Eton College Chapel. Uh, mm. There's a kind of similar approach there. Are they fair comparisons? Are they comparisons that you'd make yourself influences or not? Yes, they're fair uh, compar comparisons, Jasmine. I'll tell you a nice story about Mark Chagall. Um, he, uh, near us in Fraunau, a gallery with seven rooms um, had an exhibition of Chagall's prints. Um, but they, that filled five rooms, so they had two rooms left. And they scratched their heads and they asked me to, to fill those two rooms. Um, and they didn't change the exhibition title to the two marks um, because I was a side exhibition parallel with him. But um, I, was, I felt very complimented to have this association. And in fact, that exhibition uh, was almost 100% selling for me. Um, people came to the Marc Chagall uh, um, exhibition, which were, was, an, a, a, was artworks which were not for sale. Um, and they, they bought me out. Uh, and uh, I also got some very nice commissions from it. So the, the Marc Chagall thing, I, um, I've always known that. that and I, 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 fit, um, I, I fit as myself, but I think I fit in between um, the, 
uh, the work of uh, Piper in England um, and the, the influence of some of the Germans that I've mentioned, 20th century German artists. I'm, I'm quite comfortable in my, in my sort of unique little funny way with my funny figures and so on. And, um, and I can accept my, these influences um, th that have been on me since I was a student. When the, of course, in those years when I was a student, the, the German post-war thing was really being, uh, becoming known in Europe and in America. You might think of the Schaffertization of America was the, a cover of one of the glass magazines from 1976, perhaps. And uh, um, he was doing his world tours with his, um, with his compass and set square, doing all those parallel lines uh, in lead. Uh, for every type of building. Um, so, of course, they're all influences. Yeah. I, th I think y you allow influences, you can't not have them. Um, you absorb them, but, you, but you're playful with your own work and you're constantly renewing your playfulness to keep, it, to keep your own work alive. Um, and, uh, uh, um, but your eyes are open to uh, everything that's going on around you. So I go to stained glass exhibitions to visit churches still, and some of it's going to rub into me. Maybe it's a color combination or the way a line was handled or, or two colors met, um, it, w whatever. You can't uh, deny it. Um, it's, it's important to be open to it, I think. Fantastic. Well, we will stop there, Mark, because um, I think we've pretty much run out of the questions and I know that we've been on online for a while. Um, so I just want to, on behalf of all of us who are here this evening and especially the Stained Glass Museum, thank you again for taking the time to share with us uh, stories around your work and also this in, in fantastic body of work um, which we've really got to know better this evening um, so thank you so much for joining us and on a big day for you because I know you had your Covid jab earlier so we really I appreciate did. that. Yeah, thank you. Um, and thank you all for coming. I'm just going to ask my colleague Emily to uh, share a final screen so you can see um, that we what we have coming up so next week we have medieval treasures of leicester wigston's house glass by erica statham and then the following week um emily my colleague and i will uh talk through some stories of some of the windows in our stained glass collection um and and what happened to the buildings that they came from so thank you ever so much for joining us this evening don't forget, if you want to find out more about the museum and support it, um, you can join our friends organisation. Have a good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us and hope to see some of you next week. Goodbye. <laughs>